Are there toxic chemicals in food packaging? So food packaging is um, really an area of, I would say, extreme concern. And if you've seen the movie Dark Waters, uh, which is currently in theaters with Mark Ruffalo, you'll know why. This is a story of unbelievable corporate corruption in a company, DuPont, that knew they were creating harmful chemicals and continued to do it anyway for decades and was caught red-handed with information from their own documents, from their own science, uh, making a, a set of chemicals called PFAS or PFOA um, that are used in packaging, non-stick packaging, non-stick pans, Teflon pans. Um, they're extremely toxic. And um, the movie tells the whole story. I, I won't go into it, but it's incredible to me that story. The science was so strong. It is so strong. Um, people refer to them as forever chemicals. They did stop producing them, but they're unfortunately still used in lots of different food packaging. So um, that's worth learning about and certainly worth seeing that movie to see what we're up against in terms of companies that are so focused on continuing profit streams, no matter what the science says, no matter what the health effects are, they just feel this, this singular focus to keep increasing their profits for as long as they possibly can till they get caught up in lawsuits, pay a few people off, nobody goes to jail. This company has become now one of the leading companies in control of our food system. Dow and DuPont merged together, and then they changed their name to Corteva, which they said means uh, a combination between heart and nature. But you can also take that word to its roots and say that it could be interpreted as to cut off life. And I think that's a good way to sort of think about what's happening with our food system being controlled by chemical companies. And I'm going to be talking about that later today at the conference. How about furniture and carpet and paints? So all of this, yeah, is I said, that's why the, the story from the beauty industry that it's just low levels of phthalates or formaldehyde or toluene or what have you in my product, you're going to find those chemicals all around you in your home. And it's not so formaldehyde, for example, we found it in baby shampoo, we found it in Johnson's baby shampoo. That was a huge scandal. Uh, non-toxic, pure as water. I found out doctors were prescribing it as an eye solution. I, I mean, that product, don't put it in your eyes. Uh, they have cleaned it up as well, but that took a years-long uh, pressure campaign, um, which was ultimately successful. But the formaldehyde, again, low levels, we don't think it's a problem, but you're also going to find formaldehyde in carpeting and high levels in kitchen cabinets. But here's the thing, you wouldn't find formaldehyde in kitchen cabinets in Europe because it's not allowed. And in fact, most of our furniture is produced in China. It's also not even allowed in China to put formaldehyde in furniture. They literally have two streams of production. Formaldehyde glues, it's, it's very effective as a glue. So particle board furniture and that sort of furniture is where, where you might find it. Um, you know, the formaldehyde containing glue strain goes to the United States, non-formaldehyde, China, and Europe. So that's the difference between countries that, uh, and especially Europe, does this, takes a more precautionary approach with chemicals and just says, if we know it's toxic, you can't use it. Um, in many cases, they still have a lot of improving to do there as well. But in the United States, it's really anything goes unless you can prove it's killing somebody, and even then you're going to have a hard time getting it off the market. Is the beauty industry making sure its products are safe before releasing them to the public? So they don't have to, um, and that's also surprising to many people. Uh, the beauty industry is regulated by the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act from the 1920s. That law was passed, and the FDA was established, and, or maybe it was the 30s, a long time ago. That very large law uh, had two, I think it was 350 pages or something, it had two and a half pages that uh, applied to cosmetics, and it was mostly what the FDA can't do. So they can't recall products, they can't require pre-market safety testing. It's different with drugs, um, they do require pre-market safety testing, they can take um, the products off the market. So they've not had that power 
uh, over cosmetics. And I would say at this point, everyone agrees, everyone, both parties in Congress, even the beauty industry and the biggest companies are saying we need to reform this law. And I think the companies recognize that people have lost confidence in their products. They know um, that a, a completely no regulation system is not helping them at all. They can't, there was some pressure in the 70s to reform the law. They did at that point agree to voluntary partial labeling. And they set up um, an interesting uh, group called, it's, it's sort of a quasi-governmental group. It's not the government, it's the industry pretending to be the government. It's called the Cosmetics Ingredient Review Panel that looked over ingredients and made voluntary recommendations. Um, it was completely dominated, though, by the industry. Literally shared offices with the trade association, um, often did what the trade association wanted them to do. But even when they came out with a recommendation for a product, uh, the industry was free to ignore it, and, and they often did. So one example was the terrible chemical and skin lightening creams called hy hydroquinone. Um, extremely toxic, banned in Europe, used in skin lightening creams, which are an awful product line to begin with that doesn't need to exist and sends terrible messages about what it means to be beautiful, but also contains this highly toxic chemical that you're not supposed to leave on the skin, but you'll often find on shelves today um, these products that are advertised for overnight use or with the picture of a 10-year-old on the cover. It's same thing with hair dyes. Um, so, yeah, there's really a lot of shenanigans <laughs> to, to push products on younger and younger kids, even though they're known to be toxic. Is there a government agency looking out for the public interest, or is it focused on protecting the beauty industry? So the FDA is supposed to be um, looking out for products, and, and it has unfortunately served more as a marketing arm for the beauty companies. Um, and in fact, uh, when I was doing this work, he's since left, but a fellow named Gerald McEwen was in charge of the Personal Care Products Council. He was also 30 years at FDA in charge of regulating the beauty industry. Um, <laughs> one of the ironies about these efforts to reform the law, he, I heard him bragging at a beauty industry conference at one point about how he got rid of the requirement for companies to report to the FDA when people have adverse health effects. Um, and then, you know, here he is sort of bragging about that, and now the industry says, we need to bring that back. Okay, it's a small piece of what needs to happen to regulate and reform the industry, but it was very much like many agencies in the U.S., a revolving door, industry, government, industry, government. The pesticide industry is notorious for this, and right now, I mean, there was just an article in the New York Times about how most, I think, most, maybe all, of the top environmental regulatory employees at the government are oil, coal, and pesticide industry lobbyists. And that's ex very intense now <laughs> under the Trump administration, ridiculously so, but also has always been the case that lobbyists have way too much power in Washington and essentially have written the rules and then carried out the regulations for protecting health against chemicals. In chapter one of Not Just a Pretty Face, what did you mean by indecent exposure? So the indecent exposure that we have to our bodies every day from an unaccountable chemical industry and how surprising that is to sort of see the extent of it. Um, but we see it now through science. And one of the studies that I wrote about in that first chapter of my book that really personally motivated me and I think all of us that worked on the campaign for safe cosmetics it was a study done in 2006 by Mount Sinai and the Environmental Working Group. And they analyzed the umbilical cord blood of newborn infants. So before they are even in the world um, and found hundreds of chemicals known to be toxic in every single baby. So when we see that picture that babies are being born into the world pre-polluted with industrial chemicals, isn't it time to say, how can we do things differently? And I think we're asking that question on so many levels because we know from science, and I mean, this was 10 years ago that I wrote the book, but there is no doubt that science 
and ecology and all the science from nature are telling us that we have no choice but to reform the systems under which we've been living.